Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Simplify Your Migration Journey to AWS, uh, How to Migrate and Protect Your Workloads with Zero Disruption and No Data Loss. When you join today's webinar, you select to join either by phone call or the computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. Also from this control panel, you have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Uh, if for any reason we cannot get to your question, we'll, we plan on responding to each of you personally through email. Uh, the deck will be available through SlideShare along with a recording of the webinar two to three days after the conclusion of this presentation, so keep an eye out for that email. Uh, with that said, my name is Carmen Puccio. I'm a Partner Solutions Architect here at Amazon Web Services, and I'll be your speaker and moderator for today's webinar. So before we get to Cloud Indoor, let, let's just talk about what sets AWS apart. Um, first and foremost, customers have selected AWS for years because we've proven ourselves to be committed to customer success, or as we call it, cu customer obsession. And at AWS, we start with the customers first and we work backwards from there. And when you look at our roadmap, it's, it's, it's really amazing that 90 to 95% of our roadmap is driven by what our customers tell us. Uh, we believe that AWS stands apart in the market because of the six factors that you see here. And just to highlight a couple of them, uh, first I'd like to talk global footprint. We have 16 regions around the world today with 42 availability zones, and, and we're not close to being done. And if you consider we just expanded our new regions in Ohio and Canada and London, it presents a large opportunity for cloud computing internationally. Uh, I'd also like to talk about the ecosystem. AWS has a rapidly growing partner ecosystem made up of two categories, independent software vendors and systems integrators. So ISVs like Cloud Indoor provide software solutions that are either hosted on or integrated with the AWS cloud. Uh, SIs design, build, and manage solutions on the AWS cloud on behalf of our customers. We also have the AWS Marketplace, which is a managed and curated software catalog with an e-commerce storefront that helps customers innovate faster and reduce costs by making it easy to discover, evaluate, procure, and immediately deploy and manage third-party software solutions. So when it comes to migrating to AWS, our customers are really doing some amazing things. And customers look to AWS because of the pillars that I mentioned before, things like agility and cost savings and elasticity and the breadth of functionality around our services that enable our customers to deploy globally in minutes. So to quickly highlight a couple of these customers, for instance, when it comes to scale, Netflix is a great example of what can be done on AWS. If, if you consider that Netflix consumes 40% of the US internet bandwidth at peak hours, you need not only scalability, but you need reliability and you need a global footprint to meet the demand for your customers. Um, they have tens of thousands of instances running across multiple regions, hundreds of microservices, and they, and they serve hundreds of thousands of requests per second along with serving one billion 1 billion hours of content per month out of AWS. When it comes to security, it's always a top priority for us here. And when it comes to our customers with strict security requirements, Capital One is a great example. Uh, Capital One is using AWS as a central part of its technology strategy. And as a re result, the bank plans to reduce its data center footprint from 8 to 3 by 2018. Uh, Rob Alexander, the CIO of, of Capital One, said at reInvent in 2015 that we believe we can operate more securely in AWS than our own data centers. And, and that statement goes a long way because it, it tells you that AWS has been architected to be one of the most flexible and secure cloud computing environments available today. So, when customers are ready to adopt and they're ready to start migrating to AWS, they could run into some challenges. Uh, one of the things we, we hear is we see many customers who, who have existing, in, ex, existing investments. And we see those customers still take advantage of those existing on-premises investments in a hybrid model. We look at that as a necessary part of cloud adoption. It's important to realize that as you build your application migration backlog, you prioritize those investments accordingly. Um, skeptical stakeholders. Many customers may have a skeptical stakeholder, but this is where you really need to engage those stakeholders within the business to create a strong business case for cloud adoption and ensure that it's prioritized and aligned between your organization's business strategies and goals along with your IT strategies and goals. 
Um, fear of downtime during migration. This is where a tool like Cloud Endor can really help you because this is where you need to build a test plan around your migration to build confidence. But you also need to look at taking advantage of tools to assist in the migration to actually shorten those downtime windows. Uh, when it comes to lack of cloud expertise, this is really where if you build a cloud center of excellence, it's really the most important critical foundational investment an organization can make. Uh, building a cross-functional team from a diverse group of individuals who are willing to learn, it's really perfect for your cloud center of excellence. And those individuals will be the one to help create a culture of experimentation and teach others as they progress through uh, their journey in cloud adoption. So when it comes to APN partners, um, enterprises that are migrating to AWS, they, they require that expertise, tools, and alignment of businesses, business and IT strategy. And many organizations can accelerate their migration and their time to results through partnership. And it's important to remember that remember, regardless of where you are in your cloud journey, APN partners can help you. And this is one of the reasons that we have the AWS Partner Competency Program. And the Partner Pro Partner Competency Program has categories for SIs and ISVs that can help enterprise customers migrate applications and legacy infrastructure to AWS. Um, within that, we have the Migration Competency, which Cloud Endor is a part of, and it's really, it's really there to help act as a clear recommendation of tool sets that drive both consulting partners and customers to migration success, and it's intended to highlight partners who offer a low-risk path to AWS from their current environment. So what, what you're seeing here is what we're calling the AWS migration process, or sometimes it's also called the mental model. And it's built from the AWS cloud adoption framework. Um, the, the one thing to call out here is that each migration has its own set of requirements and its own set of challenges. Migrations are unique. But the, the cloud adoption framework is a simple and agile process to achieving sustainable business value within AWS cloud services. Uh, we could spend a, a whole session talking about migration process and methodology, so I just really wanted to give you a visual representation um, on the migration process to see how it's broken up into phases and how tools could help you through your journey. So if you look at the design um, aspect and the migration integration and validation aspect, we actually tie those together. We call it the migration factory. And this is really where you should build in automation in your migration. And as you, as you use tools like Cloud Endor to migrate more and more applications, you're going to start to see patterns emerge that will allow you to migrate with velocity. And lastly, before I hand it over to Gonin, uh, we have the AWS Core Migration Services. So we're, we're constantly evolving our services while trying to make it easier for our customers to migrate workloads to the cloud. And regardless of whether a customer is trying to move their servers or a database or data to the cloud, the services and tools that help with the migration share common goals. And it, it, that goal is to, to facilitate a migration to AWS by minimizing downtime and application workload impact, and to try and minimize data loss. So with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Gonin from Cloud Endor. All right, thanks. Thanks so much, Carmen. All right, so hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. My name is Gonin Stein. I'm the VP of Business Development for Cloud Endor. I manage our partnership with AWS, and I also have been working closely with our customer that joined to present today as well, uh, Keith from uh, InDemand. Uh, what I'll do is first get started with uh, kind of explaining where we come into the ecosystem from and what we see. Uh, let me transition to the next slide. All right. So today, you know, what we'll, we'll talk about primarily are two topics that uh, that go hand in hand in many situations: the topics of migration of mass uh, mass scale enterprise migrations over to the cloud, over to AWS as well as protecting your systems for so business continuity or disaster recovery, leveraging the cloud. Uh, what we've been seeing is that obviously the cloud providers have uh, uh, advanced quite uh, significantly over the past few years, Amazon being at the top, and organizations are now proven to be able to run their businesses much faster, more cost effectively in the cloud. And today, with uh, technologies like Cloud Endure uh, leveraging the uh, Amazon infrastructure, it's uh, easier than ever to migrate enterprise workloads into the cloud. Uh, in the past, it used to be very difficult. Now it's becoming easier and easier. We'll talk about that in more detail today. Uh, the other topic of business continuity to disaster recovery is the fact that you can now leverage cloud for protecting your workloads. And in, instead of the traditional way of doing things on-premise, of protecting workloads on-site and having to 
maintain and pay for a duplicate infrastructure, compute, storage, licensing, but the cloud, the whole beauty is that you don't have to do that anymore. The pay-as-you-go model, pay for what you use only when you need it, allows you to achieve dramatic savings easily over 80%. So that's what we'll talk about today. All right, next slide. All right, so uh, every year we conduct surveys, different migration surveys and disaster recovery surveys, and some things are becoming very clear. First of all, the company's expectations are changing. When they look to migrate servers into the cloud, in the past, uh, companies were kind of expecting that downtime would be required. Uh, it was a necessary evil, not something very pleasant, but the, the thought was that it, it must happen. It's going to disrupt the business no matter what. And over the years, in our survey of 2017, we've seen that many more companies, more than double, are not accepting that. They, they want as little downtime as possible, uh, either near zero or less than an hour. So we're seeing a lot of that happening. All right, and then in terms of the challenges, uh, there are many different challenges that customers are still facing when they're looking to migrate to the cloud and things that they're concerned about, but the top three that you can see here are the, uh, the concerns of first minimizing downtime, or in other words, how many hours or minutes or seconds is my business going to be down, my applications are going to be down whenever I make the transition to the cloud. That's the first thing that comes up very frequently, staying within budget, obviously and then performance impact on production. So I have my existing applications that are serving my end user community. What is going to be the impact on those applications when I facilitate the move, when I leverage uh, tools like Cloud Endure or try to do things on my own and migrate into the cloud? And then of course there are other things like minimizing data loss, that's obvious, security and compliance, how can you ensure that the data remains secure at any given point? Other challenges, but the top three would be, just to reiterate, downtime, minimizing downtime, staying within budget, and uh, ensuring that performance impact is not felt on the production environments. Okay. And then finally, in terms of uh, companies that are moving applications to the cloud, uh, it's, it's no secret that uh, public cloud is, is ramping up very rapidly. You can see kind of the trends that we've been observing in our surveys that we've conducted. So public cloud is uh, definitely growing faster than any other uh, vertical. So on-premise virtual machines or physical machines or private clouds are uh, nowhere near uh, where public cloud is, and it's only growing much more rapidly. So to summarize, what do companies really want to do, right? Summarize of uh, what, what is of interest when you're moving into the cloud. First of all, co uh, companies are looking for an enterprise-grade migration solution. Enterprise-grade meaning that you can uh, move any applications, no questions asked, no ifs, ands, or buts, uh, have one unified process for all of your enterprise applications, and ensure that nothing breaks, that all application interdependencies are kept, that you can very qu quickly deploy the application, deploy the replication uh, mechanism and, and get the data replicated to the cloud uh, with little to no system disruption, uh, of course, in an affordable fashion. And also, most importantly, something that Carmen mentioned before is the ability to test without impacting the source applications. Because at the end of the day, when you migrate, you want to be able to sleep well at night instead of having to fear of what's going to happen during the move, during the cutover window. And the whole point here is that you're able to do that. You're able to test as many times as you wish before uh, pulling the trigger and cutting over the systems into the cloud. So with that, let me uh, hand it over to Keith. Keith, over to Thank you. Thank you, Gonin. Thank you, Gonin. Good afternoon, everyone. Let me start off by giving you a brief introduction about In Demand. We are the nation's biggest distributor of transactional content in North America. We're owned by the top multiple system operators, Comcast, Charter, and Cox. We serve hundreds of video providers across North America. We provide pay-per-view and video on-demand services such as first run and library movies for major studios and indies plus big pay-per-view events like boxing and UFC. We also offer pro sport packages delivering 10,000 live games each year, including transport services and marketing. 
We have a comprehensive technical infrastructure which supports distribution of more than 300,000 hours of content per year, which supports various departments with content acquisition, content prep, delivery, data, and royalty management. We're basically the company that makes pay-per-view and video on-demand work for our owners and affiliates. Situation. So we were still, we were and we still are a VMware shop. And we used their replication service to sync between our on-prem data center and our co-location facility. The co-location was our DR site and also hosted our consumer-facing services. At that time, our co-location annual contract was up for renewal and it was going to be an increase in cost. At that point, we decided to change gears and move our DR and consumer-facing services from the co-location to the cloud. So why choose AWS? We had some exposure to AWS, running a small sample of dev and QA processes there. When we, when we started looking at all the services they offered, like IAM, EC2, RDS, Direct Connect, and Route 53. We knew that these were the services needed to support our co-location environment. And as we became more familiar with these services, we realized that our business could become more flexible. No longer needing to provision hardware, being able to spin up and down service quickly, and not having to deal with any more building outages, enabled us to become more agile. I'm going to share a story to address scalability. In May 2015, InDemand was preparing for a pay-per-view boxing event. A few hours leading up to the event, our site was overwhelmed by consumers looking for information to purchase this event. The backend database was unable to handle the enormous flood of connections and started to refuse them. But we were fortunate. We had just moved our consumer-facing services to AWS. So we're able to increase the RDS stack immediately. We're able to restore connections, which helped drive consumers to purchase this event, helping make this the largest paper event, event in, history, in history. And if you guys haven't figured out which event it was, it was the Floyd Mayweather Jr. versus Manny Pacquiao boxing event. So the table was set and we had our cloud provider, but we needed service tool to help us move our processes to the cloud. Here are some of the challenges we faced. We looked at tools using VMware snapshots. The snapshots were too numerous. It slowed down our environment and ate up our storage pools. Another issue what we ran into was there was no support for legacy applications. Unfortunately, we had some Windows 2003 service at the time we need to get those moved over as well. There was no support for databases over one terabyte in size. When we finally found a tool to help us replicate a server to AWS, the failback test back to our on-prem data center was unsuccessful. And we wanted a DR solution not only to replicate from on-prem to AWS, but also from region to region. So why did we choose Cloud Endure? First, it came highly recommended by AWS. Second, it was simple and easy to implement, a self-service tool which could be purchased at the AWS Marketplace. The agent was lightweight and easy to install. During our POC, they were the only service tool that met all our challenges and even exceeded our expectations. We used a live migration tool to help us move our co-location environment to AWS we're currently using their DR tool to help replicate our on-prem service to AWS. And because of how easy and quickly we can migrate and protect our workloads with Cloud Endora, we've continued to rapidly move our existing on-prem processes to AWS with near zero downtime. 
In conclusion, it's because of the great partnership between AWS and Podendor, InDemand has been able to close down our cold location and move so aggressively to the cloud. It has enabled our business to become more innovative and resilient. So I guess thank everyone for their time. Golden, back to you. Thank you so much, Keith. Thanks a lot. Uh, great, great story, and uh, I think uh, it's excellent that you were able to kind of hit on the, the different things that Amazon can provide, the different things that Cloud Endor can provide, and we're very happy, we're thrilled with uh, the experience that you've had. So thanks for switching it back to me. Uh, with this uh, part of the presentation, let me dive into more technical details. I know that a lot of the folks on the uh, webinar today want to understand how this actually works, what happens behind the scenes, so I'll focus on that during this part of the presentation. So when you look at Cloud Endure, right, it's a, there's the whole uh, magical aspect of being able to take a live running server from anywhere, physical environment, virtual environments, or even other clouds, and replicate those workloads without disruption into AWS. Uh, and it, but it's much e easier said than done. There are a lot of challenges that can happen along the way, uh, such as the ones that Keith has mentioned before, taking snapshots that disrupt your systems, and so on. Uh, what Cloud Endure does is we've developed three pillars to our technology. Uh, this is all uh, our own technology that, uh, that get, makes everything happen. The first pillar of our technology is the uh, replication component. So Cloud Endure has an OS-based agent that runs at the Windows or Linux OS level. And that agent conducts non-disruptive, continuous block level replication. And what this means, if you kind of break apart those uh, different words there, uh, what it means is that since we run at the OS level and we don't require hypervisor access or storage, direct storage access, is th this makes us agnostic to infrastructure. This is why we can easily replicate from any physical environment, virtual environment, or cloud-based environment, as long as the operating system is supported, with the common Windows and Linux versions, we will replicate the data without any issues. And the fact that we do it at the block level also means that we are application agnostic. So very common workloads that we replicate include SQL servers, Oracle servers, SAP workloads, or any other homegrown application that has been developed by the company, by the enterprise for many, many years, we can move as well, uh, and that's really agnostic to us. And we do it in a non-disruptive fashion. So there is no reboot required when our agent gets installed. There is no performance impact that's noticeable in any way. And the data loss is going to be zero. So a zero RPO for migration is a near zero measured in sub-second for disaster recovery. That's the first component. The second component, which is critical, is going to be the uh, conversion engine. So the conversion engine is what makes the system run natively in the cloud. Uh, th this means that when you take a machine that's coming from a physical environment or a, a VMware-based environment, let me make sure the slide here can progress. There we go. So when you're taking a machine from a physical environment or a virtual environment, it's not going to just magically come up in AWS. It needs to be converted first. So this is the 30-second machine conversion process that Cloud Endure kicks in whenever the machine comes up in the cloud. And this includes all the, all the different changes that are required to ensure the system is now compatible and running natively in AWS, networking changes and bootloader changes, et cetera. And this results eventually in a very minimal cutover time or failover time, depending on what you're using the product for, migration or disaster recovery. And it also helps you avoid any kind of lock-ins. So if you're locked into uh, your data center, to a co-located facility, uh, and you're looking for an easy way to move into the cloud, you can definitely do that. Next, we have the orchestration. So again, it's one thing to move the data, which is the first component I talked about. It's a uh, different story that I've just discussed, the uh, conversion aspect of it, so making sure the machine becomes compatible with the cloud. And then there's the need to be able to do it at scale. Right? So when you have a, a large migration wave where you want to spin up many machines in the cloud at the same time, uh, or if you're using it for disaster recovery, that need, be, that, that need becomes even more dramatic because you, you may have a disaster and you need to spin up your servers at grand scale, bring up hundreds or thousands of machines at a time. So fortunately, since we're leveraging cloud, we're leveraging Amazon as a target, those resources are there, and we just have a very comprehensive mechanism that leverages the cloud-based APIs and spins up everything very quickly, extremely rapidly. And this again results in the RTO, the recovery time objective, being measured in minutes. So we replicate, convert, and orchestrate the system and the orchestration part of it and the conversion part of it is extremely quick. 
And finally, it also results in dramatic cost reduction because uh, instead of, as I mentioned earlier, instead of leveraging the traditional way of doing things, of maintaining duplicate inf infrastructure, uh, both on the source and target side, we don't need to do that. We're just replicating the data. We're keeping the data in sync and bringing everything up whenever needed. And I'll talk about that in more detail as we get into a few uh, architectural diagrams in a moment. And finally, it's very easy, right? So it's cloud scalable and very easy. So you have a self-service dashboard, as Keith mentioned before. You can manage it uh, very simply, log into uh, to that web console, see the status of what's going on, how many machines are currently in sync. If any machine is currently not in sync or not in sync yet, you'll see why and when, when it'll be in sync. And then if disaster strikes or whenever you want to migrate and cut over, you can just uh, click a button, literally one click, and the system comes up in the cloud. So those are the three pillars of capability. In terms of how this works, I'll start from a high level. The high level process with Cloud Endure is that you install an agent on the source machine, so you identify what machines you want to move over to the cloud or protect into the cloud or protect within the cloud between one region and another. And then once the replication begins in a non-disruptive fashion, you can configure what is called the blueprint. So we keep the data in sync with Cloud Endure uh, technology keeps the data in sync into a very lightweight staging area that's really dormant. That's why it's so cost effective. And during that time, you can define the target blueprint. So the target blueprint indicates where the machine belongs eventually and how it's going to come up. So for example, what instance types are going to be used for each machine? What storage device is going to be used for each machine? IP addresses, subnets, security groups, uh, IAM roles, tagging, and so on. And once you've configured that blueprint, you can go ahead and simply test. So that one-click process of testing the machine, bringing it up. Essentially, when you test, what happens is that Cloud Endure takes the data that has been replicated in real time and that is currently up to date down to the second, applies the blueprint that was configured, and brings up the machine within minutes. And if certain changes are required, if, for example, you've uh, uh, misconfigured something, you've used a wrong IP address or an instance type that's too small, or maybe an instance type that's too large, so you're over-provisioning for no good reason. You can very easily just go back one step, make the corrections to that blueprint without having to restart replication, obviously. Replication is always in, in real-time sync. So just make the correction to the blueprint and test again and again until you're happy. This is really how a migration project looks like, or a prep or DR looks like. You uh, keep the data in sync in real-time, which is what Cloud Android does behind the scenes, you uh, configure the blueprint, make corrections until you're happy, and when you're happy, just schedule a very short cutover window, which can be minutes of cutover, where you stop the end user access to the source application, bring up the machine one last time in the cloud, and flip the switch, uh, or redirect your user traffic, your DNS user traffic into the cloud. That's basically how Cloud Endure works from a high level. With that, let's talk about what happens behind the scenes, right? So again, all this is, uh, is, is uh, good and well uh, from a high level, but let's, uh, let's talk about really how we help reduce the costs and achieve this uh, live migration or, or live disaster recovery, leveraging AWS. So here is a typical scenario, right? This is a, an environment that's running on-premise in a source data center somewhere uh, on physical machines, on virtual machines, or hybrid, doesn't matter. And you, you have multiple operating system types and versions. You've got Windows servers, you've got Linux servers, whether it's Oracle or CentOS or RHEL or whatever the case may be. And you've got different applications running on them. You've got SQL servers, Exchange, SharePoint, uh, Oracle databases, SAP workloads. You can have any of those running on premise. So just a, a, a several machines attached to different storage devices. And then you want to replicate them to the cloud for migration or protection purposes. So what you do is you install an agent on the source machines. You know, no, no reboot, no disruption. Agent gets installed and begins replicating the data into a lightweight staging area in the cloud. And this is all auto-provisioned by Cloud Endure in the most cost-effective way possible. So we don't create a duplicate infrastructure in the cloud in order to keep the data in sync. That would kind of be missing the point of cloud because you don't have to do that. You can only spin up what you need whenever you need it. So Cloud Endure does it very effectively. We take many machines, it's a many to one relationship ratio, where we take many machines from the on-premise environment, and these are expensive machines. They could be running on expensive compute, expensive operating systems, expensive software. And what we do in that staging area is we simply create a tiny T2 small Linux replication server. And, uh, and that server is basically a helper server 
that keeps the data in sync. Uh, and by the way, uh, participants on the, on the webinar, in case any questions come up uh, while I'm going through this, feel free to write them in the chat box and we'll be sure to address them towards the end of the presentation. So back to the, to the architectural diagram, we keep the data in sync. We also use very low cost storage that, uh, that keeps the data in real time sync. So we're using the uh, cheapest forms of EBS storage, of elastic block storage on Amazon, and that's really it, right? So there is no cost of operating systems here. There is no cost of third party application licenses uh, like uh, Oracle servers or SAP servers. And this is a dormant environment that can be launched within minutes if disaster strikes or whenever you want to test it or when you want to migrate. In terms of security, the data is always encrypted, so it's encrypted in transit using 256-bit AES encryption. It can also go over private tunnel, so you can use your VPN connections or uh, the Amazon Direct Connect in order to replicate the data, and it's always keeping the data in real-time sync. This is what happens during ongoing replication. Next, uh, let's talk about what happens when you want to bring up the machine, when you actually want to use it. So when you want to use your machine, this is what happens. Uh, you have the data that's keeping in real-time sync into that staging area that we've talked about in the previous slide. And now let's imagine that you want to migrate that machine, you want to cut over or orchestrate a DR scenario. So you click a button within the Cloud Endure web console that uh, launches everything, that starts to orchestrate the creation of all the different machines. And what we do is we take these volumes from the staging area that you see on the left-hand side that are being kept in real-time sync down to the second, and we're then reconstructing them very quickly within the target location in Amazon of your choice. So it could be a target region and different VPCs or subnets. You define that in advance within your blueprint, and then when the time comes, Cloud Endure will basically take those volumes that are being kept in real-time sync, launch them within those subnets, attached to the appropriate instances, so Windows machines, Linux machines, whatever the case is, and also perform the conversion. This is the point where the conversion process of the boot volumes will take place automatically behind the scenes, uh, injecting the Amazon Zen hypervisor drivers, uh, uh, making the bootloader changes, installing the cloud tools, making networking changes. So all that happens behind the scenes within minutes, and the end result is that you have minutes of an RTO, so recovery time objective of mere minutes that it takes Cloud Endure to uh, orchestrate everything, and then plus the time that it takes for the machine to boot. So if the machine takes another few minutes to boot, then you'll wait those few minutes, then the machine's up and running, and you're done. So by doing that, you're basically benefiting from a, an extremely aggressive uh, recovery solution with very, very aggressive RPOs and RTOs with a cost reduction of an extremely cold standby. That's kind of the bottom line. All right, so why Cloud Endure, just to kind of summarize. So migration, from a migration standpoint, it's a simplicity and speed. It's push out agents on a massive scale. You can do it in an unattended fashion, and the fact that it's agnostic to applications and infrastructure makes your life very easy. You don't need to build a skill set for moving one type of application over another. There is no disruption, which customers really love. The fact that there is no reboot or no performance impact is uh, extremely compelling. Uh, it really is designed for mass migrations with near zero cutover downtime. Uh, Carmen mentioned that before, as you're building your toolkit for migrations, it can really be used for facilitating this mass migration scale, and you can do it uh, uh, very quickly. And once you're in the cloud, obviously benefit from agility that you get in the cloud and eliminate any of the lock-in that you may have today. So if you're concerned about the fact that you're, you're locked with your co-located facility or even locked with a different cloud provider, we can help you easily move into AWS. Right, and then from a disaster recovery standpoint or a business continuity standpoint, the uh, benefits that we typically see our customers getting excited about are, first off, the cost reduction, so the TCO reduction by easily over 80%. Uh, and this is a result of the architecture that I've described, the fact that we keep the data in real-time sync using that lightweight staging area and only bring up the machines in their full scale whenever you want to use them, whenever disaster strikes or you want to test or migration uh, cutovers occur. It's very simple, agnostic applications and infrastructure, as I mentioned earlier. The self-service part of it, the fact that you can manage this on your own and you're, you don't need to build expertise to do, to do this is, uh, is very uh, compelling RPOs and RTOs of near zero, and also the fact that you can perform an unlimited number of non-disruptive DR tests. Because it's one thing to deploy the system, it's one thing to deploy an application, but if you, it's really hard for you to test that you are really resilient. You know, how, how is this going to look like when a disaster strikes? 
you're not going to be able to sleep well at night. Uh, so we need to provide an easy solution for you to test it very frequently, and we do that as well. Uh, finally, being the ability to fail back. So if, uh, like Keith from InDemand, you still have an environment running on premise, and you're leveraging cloud for DR for cost reduction, uh, we do provide the ability to easily reverse the replication and bring you back into the on-premise environment. And of course, once you're ready to migrate, just uh, flip the switch and, and poof, you're migrated into AWS. The process of protecting your systems into AWS and then pulling the trigger to migrate is very, very similar. All right, so the results with uh, in-demand. So uh, first off, they were able to replicate their VMware servers in just two days, a very, very rapid project with uh, no limitations in terms of data volumes, disk size, database size and uh, they replicated uh, 20 terabytes of data very, very quickly. Uh, they chose Cloud Endure also to enable business continuity and disaster recovery after the migration was complete. And the other benefits that were achieved are uh, the fact that two live workloads were replicated into AWS and completely successfully migrated ahead of schedule, no downtime on the vital servers, uh, a single solution that supports both the migration and the DR with very aggressive objectives and with uh, zero impact on their performance of the applications. And with that, uh, Carmen or Alan, let me hand it over to you. Great, um, Gonan and Keith, thank you very, very much for uh, both talking about your solution. Um, Keith, thank you very much for uh, talking through um, your, your example and your success of Cloudinger. We have a few questions uh, that have come through during the talk. Um, I'm going to try and group some of these so that we have enough time to get uh, to get through as many of them as possible. Um, so, first of all, let's address a, a question around support uh, of particular operating systems. Uh, so, you know, one of the questions that came in was uh, around S uh, Simple Business Server 2008 and above. Um, what what uh, OSs in the in particularly in the Microsoft sphere do you support today? And then there was a question around uh, non x86 environments like AIX. Uh, Gonna, can you just give us a bit of a rundown of the um, you know particularly in the Windows space of these supported operating systems um, as well as non x86 x86 uh, hosts uh, source hosts? Sure, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the Cloud Endure operating system support. The first thing to consider is that uh, the operating system that you're looking to move needs to be supported by your target cloud provider. So on Amazon, you would need to check the compatibility matrix of the operating system and then uh, ensure that you can run the system there. From a Cloud Endure perspective, uh, as long as the, the cloud, in this case Amazon, supports the, the operating system, we will support any Windows 2003 server and above, so 2003, 2008, 2012, and also 2016. From the uh, SBS type operating system, uh, Alan, maybe you know if those are licensed to run. Those are probably licensed to run in AWS. Usually we run against the, um, the servers that are not the small business ones, but uh, technically we can move them. I believe SBS is not supported today, but I will follow up and, uh, and make sure with the, the, from, the, from the question's perspective. Um, I believe that uh, Windows Server, so for Windows environments you need um, cloud mobility uh, with a support agreement from Microsoft with the correct licensing um, to ensure that those, uh, that those operating systems can run on AWS. Um, but I will follow up with, uh, with the, question, the question exactly. There is a limitation on what operating systems uh, and licensing environments from uh, Microsoft are supported on AWS. Uh, I'm not sure SPS is one of them. Yeah, yeah thanks, Alan. Yeah, from a technical perspective, though, we, we can, and anything 2003 and above would be fine. Uh, all the common flavors of Linux as well, so Red Hat, CentOS, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, SUSE, and so on. And um, and as far as non x86 environments go, so um, uh, you know AIX and, and other type environments where the the source system is not running x86, um, do you have support for some of those environments and which ones? Yeah, so since our, those are not supported as well in AWS, the typical process that we see customers going through or SI partners going through is first converting them into a Linux-based system and then moving them using Cloud Endure. Does Cloud Endure have any features that support that uh, out of the box? Uh, the conversion between different operating systems, no, not at, not at this point. We would move the system as is. We would convert okay. the system to run in Amazon, but we would not convert one operating system type to another. 
Okay, good. Um, I also have a couple of questions about the, the licensing model that have come up. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you license Cloud Endure for a migration? Sure, uh, very simple. So uh, we have two different types of licensing models for migration. It's just a one-time license and you can purchase it directly from the Amazon uh, SaaS subscription marketplace. Uh, the DR product is licensed on a contract term basis, so they're again per server, just like migration on a contract term. And uh, again, the pricing for migration can be seen uh, right from the Amazon marketplace or you can reach us at sales.sales at cloudendure.com. Great. Um, so there are a few questions about how the how the replication works, and, and maybe it would worth you taking um, five minutes just to walk through the replication, hitting primarily on what is the frequency of the replication, uh, what kind of performance impact would you would you expect to see, um, where the staging environment sit. I think I think it might take uh, it might be valuable to spend five minutes just, uh, walking through some of the details of that replicated environment. Yeah, great question. Uh, so here's what we do, right? This is what, what's very unique about Cloud Endure. So the replication itself starts with an agent being deployed on the source machine without any impact, so no reboot, no performance impact, and it uh, begins reading the data from the disks. So first it identifies what disks are attached, so volumes on Windows servers or Linux servers, it identifies all of them, and then uh, provisions the appropriately sized volumes in the cloud, in that staging area. So if you have a you know, five uh, two terabyte disks on premise attached to the machine. We will create those five two terabyte disks as a cold or magnetic EBS storage within that staging area. And once those those servers and storage are provisioned in the target location in that lightweight staging area, we start replicating the data. Uh, the data replication begins with uh, the agent reading all the blocks from the disk or multiple disks and ensuring consistency at any given point. That's the name of the game. It's always ensuring block level consistency. And once the initial sync is done, so the initial read from the disks is done and the data gets replicated to the target location, the Cloud Endure agent turns to uh, a mode that we call continuous data protection. And this means that any new block that gets written to the disk, whether it's uh, database transactions that eventually get written to the disk, or operating system changes, patches, updates, files, everything eventually gets translated to blocks. And Cloud Endure's agent that runs in memory captures those block transactions when they're written to disk. Uh, we capture them in memory as they're written, so we don't re need to read anything from the disk after the initial sync is done. We capture that in memory, we compress the data in memory, encrypt the data in memory, and replicate it asynchronously to the target location of your choice. And what this means from a performance impact is that it's completely negligible because typically the uh, reasons for performance impact happen when you write data to the disk, whether it's taking snapshots that uh, uh, perform a copy on write freeze writes to the disk, or if you're using the disk as a buffer to write data, we never do that. Uh, we only read the data from the disk and then read the data that's being written to disk in memory and replicate it over the network. So you're going to see less than 1% of CPU utilization with Cloud Endure, about 100 megabytes of fixed memory buffer, and that's it. Uh, you will never see any kind of disk writes. Okay, and, and how do you, you know, is there, is there any, does the, does the, the, the client allow for or configurable um, throttles uh, so customers can decide what the performance impact is uh, to open that further up? Yeah, so again, the performance impact from a, from a uh, machine's performance perspective will never be impacted regardless, right, uh, irrespective of the frequency. If you're taking snapshots, then absolutely frequency will impact your machine. If you're taking frequent snapshots, it's impact, it impacts your machine. But with Cloud Endure, there is no concept of snapshots whatsoever. It's true uh, in-memory CDP. Uh, you can always throttle that. You can apply different quality of service to throttle that, but it's not going to have any impact on performance. It's only going to have an impact on uh, uh, increasing your recovery point objective if you apply throttling. Okay, and as a follow up, um, as a follow up to that, what happens with things like, uh, you know, if you you're streaming, you're streaming from multiple source systems, um, and you potentially have a network outage, or the network that you're attempting to stream from can't handle the number of source servers that are that are in play at the time. Um, mm -hmm. how, how does the how does the client understand that from a you know backlog perspective? So. Um, you know that then also invites the question: What happens if the the backlog exceeds the uh, the memory allocated to the client? Um, how does how does it make sure that that stuff remains consistent and deal with the network vagarities that may come up during something like this? Excellent, yeah, excellent question. And that again, you you hit the, the nail on the head. It's the, the name of the game is ensuring consistency under any circumstance. 
Uh, and this is a very common scenario, right? You can't uh, always expect the network to be stable uh, or the network to not be saturated. Uh, so what we do, what Planeter does, is whenever there is any kind of situation where the data can't be replicated over the network fast enough, for whatever the reason is, uh, saturation, network disconnection, whatever, what Platendur's uh, agent uh, does is it uh, keeps, so I mentioned that in-memory buffer before, that 100 megabyte in-memory buffer before. What we use that buffer for is for tracking the pointers to the blocks that are being written to the disk during that outage. So essentially when that outage happens, that, that, uh, the agent will start using the buffer to track all the blocks and most importantly the write order that are written to the disk and once the connection is available, we simply read the data from the disk, all the, all the data that was written during that outage uh, in its right order and replicate it across the network. And since we're only tracking pointers in that buffer, it's really, it can, be, it can store an unlimited number of changes. And these are just pointers, it's not the data. So it can store many petabytes of changes uh, for many, many years. Okay. Um, Thank you. The next, the next question is around uh, the security and the compliance processes that Cloud Endure supports today for uh, particularly customers um, in healthcare and, and financial domains is, is the very specific question. Um, you know, how does, uh, you mentioned encryption in memory. Uh, what, what, are some of the, what are some of the examples that you've had customers in those spaces uh, use Cloud Endure? Do you, do you um, have some case studies in that space? And, uh, you know, what, what does, does Cloud Endure today um, have any compliance regimes that, it's, uh, that, it, uh, that it works with? Yeah, sure. So we work with uh, financial institutes and healthcare providers, and we do have case studies that we can share. Uh, in a nutshell, what the customers are looking to, uh, to achieve when they ask us questions about security are, uh, first of all, encryption at rest, um, encryption in transit. So what happens to the data whenever it needs to move from point A to point B, and who has access to the data whenever it's moved? So from a technology perspective and an architectural perspective, first off, other than the fact that the data always gets encrypted in transit using 256-bit uh, AES encryption, which follows enterprise standards, it also is completely, we are also completely outside of the data path. So customers, uh, they can decide to replicate the data over the public internet, but most commonly we see uh, customers using a private connection, right? So VPN or Direct Connect, and this handles the, uh, the security in transit, both from a network perspective and from an encryption perspective. And then on top of that, questions come up about encryption for the data at rest. So what happens to the data once it arrives over to the Amazon location? And there again, we can apply uh, EBS encryption and we can allow the customers to use their own keys. So we enable EBS encryption both within the staging area disks as well as the actual production disks when the machine comes up. Great, thank you. Um, so are there, are there a couple of questions around um, complex application environments where an application might be running on uh, not just one machine, so Oracle rack environments where you may have uh, clustered systems um, or other types of clusters where you, you're not just looking at a single machine. Um, how does Cloud Endure generally handle that when you work with customers in those kind of environments? Um, and do you maybe have a couple of examples? Yeah, sure. So we, we do support clustered environments. Um, and this is something that we can discuss in, in more detail because it really de depends on the type of application. Um, let me give an example for Rack, right? We've done plenty of Rack migrations, Oracle Rack migrations over to AWS. And the, the, the challenge there that needs to be addressed, and again, we have plenty of experience with that, is ensure that the, uh, the replication happens in a way that Amazon can support. And the, the way that Rack typically runs on premise is that it's, uh, it's going to be a single storage device which is being written to by multiple machines, multiple instances, which is something that Amazon does not support. You can't have multiple instances writing to the same EBS storage device. And therefore, the way to migrate rack servers, and at least this has been our experience uh, plenty of times, is first off on-premise uh, convert that rack system uh, and replicate it into a slave system that doesn't run in a rack configuration that is connected to a single disk, and then take that slave uh, Oracle database, replicate it over to AWS using Cloud Endure and bring it up. So it's essentially transitioning out of Rack on-premise and then replicating that database in its entirety using Cloud Endure into AWS. Thank you. And uh, just as a, just as an add-on to that, uh, AWS provides some guidance around building uh, Oracle Rack environments um, on AWS today. Uh, you can find that on our um, on our website. Um, 
So there, there's a there's a question just to confirm that the the migration or the replication is one is one way, right? Or is it a two-way replication? So if you have the environment um, set up and you've synced the source server across to an AWS uh, uh, volume and you've done the cutover to build the new instance. It does the will the cloud Azure agent synchronize back to your on-premise environment? If you would like to, you know, if you've tested and work, you'd like to go back, or you have you have uh, some concerns about how it's working there, and you want to be able to switch back to your on-prem environment. Does it provide a two-way synchronization channel once the cutter is complete? Yeah. Uh, so the the replication is going to be uh, always a one-direction replication, but you can switch the direction whenever you want. So you can replicate to the cloud and keep keep it in real-time sync and spin up the servers whenever you want to, uh, to uh, benefit and enjoy their most up-to-date state. And if for some reason you're unhappy, you can always uh, run the agent on the cloud-based machine and replicate it back to on-premise. Okay, great. Um, so one of, the, one of the other things that has come up a couple of times in the questions is there's more to migrating a server than just synchronizing the, the, the disk and the, store, the storage and, and the operating system. Um, does Cloud Endure provide plugins uh, for things like post, uh, post migration activities, so updating DNS and, and uh, things like that, or do, would you generally work with customers to implement um, configuration management that, that does that for, you know, at, at system boot or, or things like that? Yeah, great question. So this is a, an extremely common scenario for mass migrations. Customers or partners want to have the ability to uh, spin things up uh, or, or run their scripts, and this is supported out of the box. So Cloud Endure allows any customer to configure any script of their choice that does uh, anything you want. You know, install new applications that may be required in the cloud, remove applications that may have existed on premise that are no longer desired in the cloud. So you can create anything that you want, and then Cloud Endure will orchestrate the launch of that script the first time the machine boots in AWS. Okay, um, so I think the the next major topic, um, the next major topic that that comes up a few times is from a uh, network usage perspective. Um, how aggressive uh, is Cloud Endure about the way that it sends data? I think there's a relationship between how often data is being written to disk and how much data the the agent will attempt to uh, use over the over the connection to AWS and um, you know, that can be both a private connection over something like Direct Connect or a VPN or over a public internet connection, but most likely customers are going to be using Direct Connect or open or a VPN um, into, their, into their VPC. How aggressive is, is the Cloud Engineer agent at utilizing that network connectivity? Um, and would you, how would you recommend customers manage that utilization? Yeah, okay, good, good question. So uh, Cloud Android Agent basically works in a way where we optimize anything that we can in every way we can to minimize the, uh, the data replicated over the network. Uh, but then after we do that, we will leverage whatever network is available to us. And if you want to apply quality of service, you can definitely apply quality of service, which will be transparent. But before the data gets replicated, what we do uh, is first off, we when we read the blocks from the source environment, we compare their signatures to the blocks in the target environment. So if those blocks already exist there, we will not replicate them. Once we've determined that the blocks do not exist on the target location in that staging area, we will compress them and encrypt them and replicate them over the target network. So at, at the end of the day, uh, what you need to, uh, to plan for is for your network to be able to handle uh, over time. If you have spikes, that's fine because Cloud Endure will just handle those spikes. Uh, but over time, you need to ensure that the bandwidth will allow Cloud Endure to replicate the post-compression size of the data. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so there's a couple of there are a couple of very very specific scenarios that have been uh, that that have come up in the questions, and I suppose let me address one or two of those. And we spend a couple of minutes each, and then I think we'll be out of time for questions. Um, just as a reminder, any questions that we don't get to. Um, in talking through this Q&A, uh, we will make sure and address those uh, to the people who ask the question. Um, you know, I'm trying to summarize as many questions as possible into broader topics so that we can get as many of them recorded as possible. Um, but we will make sure that individual questions are addressed to those who ask the questions. Um, so the next, the next, uh, the, the next major topic that came up is very specific workload. So how would you think about something like a Microsoft? Uh, a Microsoft SQL with shared storage cluster. Um, how would you think about migrating that to AWS uh, with with uh, with Cloud Engineer today? Can you walk us through um, the general patterns that you would use to execute on that? 
Yeah, sure. So what you would want to do is prior, so since you're using this for, uh, for migration in this type of scenario, what you would probably want to do, uh, which is the best practice we've seen, is ensure that as you prepare to uh, cut over or as you prepare to test your migration, uh, ensure that the, the database uh, cluster is only leveraging, so it's a set read only for nodes in the cluster that you are not replicating and focus on one of those nodes in the cluster that you would replicate with Cloud Endure. And then and after the cutover, you can simply rebuild uh, the cluster in AWS. That's typically what's going to be the scenario. Because what, what you don't want to happen is have the agent replicating multiple disks from within that cluster at the same time into AWS and lose consistency. OK, so it's a very similar model to how you would think about an Oracle Rack, Oracle Rack type environment where you're dealing with, with clusters that are sharing either through, uh, through multicast or, or shared storage. Exactly, yeah. Now, in a DR scenario, uh, you can definitely replicate all the systems and you would simply um, have a little bit more of a data loss from some of those servers that are not as up-to-date as the others. But for migration, the, the benefit is that you know when the migration cutover is going to happen, so you can plan to have zero uh, data loss instead of near zero data loss. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, so a couple of other questions. How does Cloud Endure plug into uh, in infrastructure, um, infrastructure capturing uh, frameworks like uh, CloudFormation or Terraform, um, to name a couple? Uh, does Cloud Endure utilize any of those to help create, uh, to help with the blueprints or to feed information into the blueprints? How would, how would customers who are looking at uh, utilizing CloudFormation build, uh, build Cloud Endure into that, into that, uh, that process? Yeah, so it's it's not necessary in most cases. I mean, if if you're if you already developed your cloud formation templates and you want to hook that into Cloud Endure, that's perfectly fine. It's up to you. We have fully documented RESTful APIs where you can uh, bring up the systems and then uh, do whatever other processes you want to perform using cloud formation templates. Uh, but if the the question comes from the angle of just bringing up the servers, that's not required because Cloud Endure uses the Amazon APIs directly uh, in a very aggressive fashion. So we, we the, the uh, benefit from our perspective of not using CloudFormation templates to bring up the servers is being able to do that much more rapidly, especially with very large environments, just given the direct use of APIs. Uh, but if you do want to use CloudFormation templates, you can simply hook into the Cloud to the Cloud Endure RESTful APIs and really do whatever you want. Good. Uh, one last question, and then we are out of time. Um, do you do you have uh, do you plan on supporting um, bulk import uh, um, services like Snowball and Snowmobile um, in the future for customers who are thinking long term about moving very very large scale storage platforms and using those as a seed basis um, for their for their uh, their instances on AWS? Yeah, sure. So uh, we already support the uh, Amazon Import Export Service, which is uh, uh, which is leveraging or can leverage block storage snaps or DD copies over to a disk. Uh, as soon as Snowball supports block storage uh, as well, uh, and uh, as far as I know, it still supports only object. But as soon as it supports block storage as well, we will be able to uh, natively leverage Snowball and Snowmobile as well. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Conan. Uh, Keith, thank you again. Carmen, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I think this has been a, a very informative uh, session. Again, if I did not get to your question, um, and Conan hasn't managed to answer your question at, as yet, uh, we will address these directly uh, um, to you. Uh, please expect that within the next couple of days. Um, again, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, have, a, have a pleasant day um, or evening wherever you are in the world.